Anne Katrin Senstad is an artist ba uh, based in Oslo and New York. Senstad's practice lies in the multidisciplinary intersections of installation art, photography, video, neon sculpture, immersive installation, land art, and site specificity. The focus of her art is in the phenomena of perception and the cognitive system in response to the properties of light, sound, and color. Zenstad is concerned with sensorial aesthetics, perception of the transformative, the transcendental ideas of art and philosophical practice. She has worked on experimental, participatory, and experimental themes since the mid-90s. Uh, Zenstad has exhibited in numerous art centers, galleries, museums, and festivals. Last summer, her work, Radical Light Second, uh, was shown at Seinäjoki Kunsthall, Seinäjoen Taidehalli. And this piece is a um, 540 square meter spatial light sculpture environment with a sound environment by a composer, uh, J.G. Uh, Thurwell. The exhibition was executed in collaboration with Kai Art Centre and Arts Promotion Centre Finland. And Aura Seikkula is an international curator and an expert in art and philosophy. And she is also my colleague at Arts Promotion Centre. She is currently based in Finland. Uh, Seikkula's recent doctoral dissertation in analytic philosophy was titled The Curatorial Episteme and it discusses the potential of intellectual sustainability and the idea of art as a meaning creating agency. Some of her recent positions include Kulturhuset Stadsteatan and Artibela Konstal in Stockholm. Um, we asked the two of you, Anne and Aura, to talk about artistic expertise and curatorial strategies. It's an honor to have you here today please. Thank you so much, Annika. Thank you for the invitation and, and hello colleagues. It's, it's my pleasure to be here and uh, talk with Anna about uh, a very interesting collaboration um, we've had together and I would say is still ongoing. Um, I will really shortly start by sharing some slides here. And I'm hoping everyone can be following this. Oh, good. Yes, <clears throat> the full screen. Okay, did not help. Okay. Um, yes, I would like to start by saying a couple of words um, about um, my curatorial practice and strategy in working. Um, which is kind of like leading them to present uh, Anne's work and, and how we are um, collaborating. So um, my main idea when working with art is that I am in a, in a position to, to provide for the art to exist, uh, meaning that um, I work with the artist and with, with art uh, in order to make it available and accessible to audiences and to encounters. And encountering the work of art um, is very meaningful to me as I see that it's exactly in this encountering that artworks gain their existence. And this is also how I, um, I see Anne's practice to be. She, um, she works, um, as Annika was saying, um, within immersive, creating immersive environments, but they are also very transformational. And in this transformation, um, she always works with the space, not in the space. And by doing so, I see that um, exactly these encounters become a part of the space uh, through her practice. Uh, what is also very interesting, what Anne often does is that as we now start to look at her work, we are going to see um, a large scale um, works that she always opens up for collaborations. So there are um, obviously, um, like Annika was also saying, um, there are, for example, soundscapes that she often collaborates for. But then also um, 
performances and other um, initiatives happen inside uh, and with her art. So I will, in order to go through her extensive uh, artistic practice, uh, we are going to look into some of the main uh, ways of her works in this order. So we will start to discuss projection installations, then have a look at land art and, and references and, and the meaning of land art to Anne. Um, then look into text, text installations, acrylic sculptures, and then finally talk about the project that was uh, presented in Sein Aoki in collaboration with Kai um, Art Center in Tallinn. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, embed the video on the slide, so I will show you a short introduction to her work, um, which I am hoping to share with you with sound. The installations are about perception of space, which means us too. <laughs> so about how we are in the world and how we perceive the world. To create an artwork in the space, you define space itself. So light is the most ephemeral, light and sound, I guess. The idea to stop light, to arrest light or to, to capture something either moving through time or in space or changing a space, charging a space. I'm in a way solidifying light itself and using it as a tool for creating a manifestation of an artwork. Yes, Anne. So, <laughs> with this short introduction, also happy to have you here. Thank um, you so much for having me. I'm very honored and, uh, and grateful to be part of this program. Yes, maybe we can start by um, uh, a very uh, classical question. If you can tell us a, a bit about your background in arts, how um, how did you start working with uh, immersions and, and light in these ways? And I'm asking this as uh, I do know that your um, educational background is, uh, is very lens-based and you've been working with uh, film and camera also for a long time. Yes, yeah, so um, when I was prior to moving to New York to study art, I was uh, working with photography, but I was also a uh, a cinema projectionist, so I had to learn very early on um, about light sources and technical aspects of how light functions in space. So I kind of learned it both scientifically and organically, um, um, which kind of followed me, was sort of embedded in my, in my um, uh, creative um, process very early on. Um, so, as a photographer, I was very conscious of working with light, and then I started working with film as uh, creating video artworks, um, where I utilized light sources as part of the, um, the video works, kind of as characters. Um, so I've just, it have, I've evolved kind of um, uh, the light source itself throughout different practices. Um, so light and color has been the sort of the essence of, of what I've been working with throughout the, you know, my whole, whole uh, education and, and uh, practice. Exactly. Um, well, having said that, uh, let's have a look at some of the projection installations that you have worked with. And um, if we can just uh, walk through some of the works that I will show you. So, um, Yes, 
This is from um, the Aurora Festival in Texas, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, this is a, a multiple multiple projection installation with sound in a, a church. It's a site specific installation that was part of the festival. Uh, it's a uh, light art and technology festival. Uh, so the church here um, was very significant because it was the first church built by the first free slaves in um, in the late 1800s in in uh, Texas. So what I included was um, sounds, that is a kind of um, drone devotional meditative sound. And um, I utilized uh, the stained glass windows, which where the light comes through to embed, embed the projections onto. Um, and churches are very special places to work with because they of the architecture and also the acoustics there. And, um, uh, and also the, uh, the usage of it, the sort of psychological space. People go in there for a reason, for, for contemplation or to, uh, you know, to pray or to, um, as, a, as a kind of, uh, you know, space from the outside world. Um, so it's a very kind of dignified and, and very narrative um, installation opportunity. Um, yeah, so I've, I've uh, created, uh, light installations in quite a, uh, three three different churches and cathedrals, and um, it's very rewarding as an artist to be able to to work with uh, those kind of unique spaces. Exactly, and and this, um, if we consider a, a church uh, as a space to encounter your work, and as a space is so um, uh, essential as a starting point to your practice. Um, could you talk a bit, a bit more about that kind of um, how you start to work? What are the, like, are there like shared point of, points of origins in all of the three churches that you work with? Is, it, is there something that you can see that becomes inspirational to you when it, when it really, um, when your work is installed in churches? Yeah, well, um, I, for me, it's very important to, to do research on the place and to respond to the place uh, because the artwork merges with the space and there's a sort of psychology of the space that I, I absorb. And um, so I look at like the history of it and the experience of being in it and, uh, and then how the artwork can um, amplify that, but also that the space has a dialogue with the artwork as well. Um, so I create ultimately a new artwork as well. So I use the space as a kind of a canvas or to create a new work. Uh, in, so it's all kind of in process um, as it goes on. In the video we just saw, um, you say that you create manifests of art and artworks. Is this something that you consider happening here as well or is this something that you would say that is always your goal? I would say that I would uh, qualify this as a manifestation of an artwork in that it's an experience, it's a, an experiential piece. Uh, it's a time-based piece that it is the light, the color, this is a video piece that is um, 28 minutes long and you go through a cycle of these compositions that um, that uh, change and alter uh, slowly over time. These sort of light lines and color lines change uh, gradually. Uh, so the whole uh, installation, it's a 30 minute installation then that you, uh, that, um, you experience as one solid artwork, um, but it's not like an object. <laughs> exactly. Okay, let's look a bit further. Here is a, uh... Oh, that's a bit blurry. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's a bit blurry. It's a close-up. Um, yeah. Where you've been projecting on a, um, on a, on a waving um, canvas, so to say. Yeah, this is from the ISEA uh, Dubai to, in 2014. And here I um, also included the sound of composer Catherine Christine Hennix, who is from the early, she's a sound uh, pioneer from the 60s, 70s in, in uh, generative sound and kind of um, 
drone sound. So here I, it's the same uh, piece, the infinitismo, where I have multiple layers of uh, textiles uh, with several projections, multiple projections on two. And I also then included aroma. So the sensory experience of, um, of these textiles moving within the space and then sound and uh, adding on aroma um, uh, involves the, the viewer in a fuller kind of sensory experience that you kind of might not be aware of what is going on. Also the idea of being part of the artwork that the, um, the, the uh, public can move within it. So that's an important part of the artwork that you become part of it itself. Um, so again, these, uh, the colors are changing very slowly, uh, the color compositions, and then you walk between all these layers of textiles that are uh, hanging in, in the space and with the wind slowly. So it's a sort of uh, scenario, but it's also as, uh, it's a composition as well. Uh, if one would like, uh, you know, document it onto a film or, um, or a photographic image, uh, yeah. Yeah, again, I feel that it's it's very inviting. And as we uh, proceed with the with your work, we will see how you you kind of. I for me, it looks like that you almost like expose yourself as an artist because you you invite the 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 viewer and the visitor and the encounter so close inside to what you are creating. Yes, so, in a way, it's I. The, I'm kind of erasing the lines between our inner world and the outer world. So exactly. to experience, I'm projecting out the, the inner creative source in a way. Exactly. <laughs> and then here. Yes, yeah, so in 2012, I was working with a group in uh, Mexico and I was invited by an architect who was restoring um, a very unique um, place called the Surreal Gardens that was created by a British eccentric called Edward James in the 1950s, where he created this kind of, he created a form of his own private Alice in Wonderland in the, in the jungle in Mexico. And it's a very unique place. Uh, so he, the, the architect was in charge of restoring all these uh, concrete uh, buildings where there are a lot of staircases that go up into go up to nothing, go up to heaven. And, and these uh, kind of like um, wild, um, uh, wild uh, mixture of architectural piece uh, sort of structures and, and sculptures. So the original idea of, of Edward James was that they would all be um, <clears throat> painted in, in different colors, very vivid colors. But that never happened or the colors on, <clears throat> on the pieces that were painted had faded away in, in the jungle um, moist and, and weather and climate. So what I did was I um, projected my video piece Color Synesthesia which is onto the different structures. Uh, it, so I spent three days there working uh, with the architects and of course this is the, in the jungle so to, to um, include technical equipment here was quite a challenge. <laughs> um, so it was a really interesting in, um, uh, project to, to work with uh, here. So this is a sort of, here again, I'm merging with the sort of the original content, but transforming it into a new, a new artwork um, in itself. Exactly, and, and like you mentioned now and in the beginning that light and color are always um, the essence of your work. And I think this is a very interesting example of that. And I would like to ask you, how intuitive is it for you to work with color and how strategic, how, how do you decide the nuances and the colors that you then work with and then become a part of the work? Well, I'm, I work with it technically, but in, in, uh, in reality, I, I work very intuitively too. I think it's very important to leave room for that. And for like you develop a handcraft uh, or like I see this kind of like as a, 
jazz musician. You in, you know how to play the instrument, but you you can improvise and you create new art, you know, new music, and you experience it while you are curating you know, creating it. So I think you have to leave room for chance. Uh, John Cage spoke about that. The uh, chance happening and that is where the the result is then uh, a creative work and then you can work with molding that after um, yeah <laughs> exactly and then finally we have um, an element here this is um, from um, the sensory chamber in yes. um, at Kai Art Center. Yes. Uh, sorry, what? Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is a projection of a video work um, onto a bed of salt. Uh, so this uh, installation, I the last one I created was at Sainayaki Kunsthal. Um, the reason for working with salt is an element that is, so I'm combining light and the grain of salt and salt, fine salt reflects light very beautifully. Um, so it's, and it also kind of, um, it's about another form of capturing light. And the video cycle, uh, the composition works through uh, different colors. Um, in this piece, I had seven different colors. And then in the center, there are, it goes between uh, circles and lines and shapes that kind of, um, that uh, I've embedded, like it vibrates. So it, it feels like the internal body, the experience of the internal body and how our uh, system uh, functions were moving throughout uh, and the electrical system, uh, yeah. <laughs> and how did you, um, how did you come about uh, with SALT for this projection series? That was, uh, I, this is the first time I've used salt, but it's been with me since I visited. I like to do uh, uh, pilgrim, art pilgrimages. <laughs> so I visited uh, Robert Smith and uh, the Spiral Jetty um, probably 15 years ago or so. And I brought with me salt from the Salt Lake. Um, so I'm very inspired by nature and uh, natural phenomena but also how art, uh, how one can um, create artworks within nature and then uh, how that works together with that dialogue. So I brought with me the source and I kind of waited for the opportunity to use it. So um, uh, this was the right time to um, combine these two. Great, well, this actually then uh, brings us uh, wonderfully to um, the practice that you have uh, with land art, but also how referential uh, land art is to you. And again, I'm gonna show uh, a video clip and hoping to be able to do that here.
So, uh, before we go through this uh, uh, exact uh, work, can you can you talk a bit about land art and its influence to you and your practice? Um, I've been inspired by land art for a very long time, even though I work with a lot of ephemeral material. Uh, but it's part of um, kind of my attraction to, to large scale and also expansive space and how we work with space. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I also uh, am interested in sort of the political aspect of this, of the social aspect of it. Um, the land artists of uh, uh, the States uh, were kind of mostly active in the 60s and 70s, uh, Michael Heiser, um, uh, Nancy Holt and uh, Smithson and, and quite a few others. And they got to work with the, uh, the large scale vast space out in the West in California and Nevada and um, and those places and they also worked with um, elements of um, kind of the universe or astronomy and um, uh, so that sort of brings that includes kind of another layer of, of uh, understanding or, or working with uh, phenomena um, of perception and also how we exist in the world. Um, uh, Agnes Dennis created in the, I think in the 70s, 80s, um, a wheat field in Manhattan that was also influ influential on me. And that was sort of to raise awareness for uh, industrialized food production and, and consumption. And uh, so it was quite political. Yes, it was poetic as well. It was a beautiful like, uh, sort of vast uh, wheat field and then with skyscrapers around right by the World Trade Center. And I actually live very <laughs> close to where that original uh, wheat field uh, was. Um, so the, um, when I started working in uh, New Orleans with, a uh, with an artist group um, in post Hurricane Katrina uh, era in 2007, 2008, uh, we worked with restoration um, through uh, cultural practices. So a lot of the sort of uh, city infrastructure was gone. You know, there were no uh, street signs anymore. There were like, there were houses that were, uh, you know, washed away. And so uh, that was a really interesting era and kind of a large, a very serious workshop for me to, to expand my own practice. So I, uh, we worked with like, um, the, the Art Foundation, they had bought, took over several buildings that were completely destroyed and the, the people had been, the families had been uh, moved to other states uh, to live in, you know, crisis uh, accommodation. So we recreated the stories of the families or we restored, some artists restored the buildings or they create, used the buildings as sculptures themselves. Uh, so it was um, really a, a, an amazing opportunity to use, utilize city uh, infrastructure as artworks um, without any restrictions. And then I got engaged with um, kind of the ecological side where um, from the hurry, from, you know, the, the floods, uh, all the whole oil industry in the Gulf, the, the heavy metals and the, uh, the poisons from that were embedded in the earth. So uh, some artists like Mel Chin and Don Dida, uh, who are very interesting artists in that down there, uh, they worked with um, forms of way to cleanse the earth, how can, uh, and also how to work with um, uh, the local, um, local uh, uh, kind of communities in the region. So I, uh, I uh, started working with a farmer, a sugarcane farmer, <laughs> um, because I wanted to create a um, sort of large scale living sculpture, but also to talk about how um, sugarcane, that's it's native to the whole Gulf region. And at that time it was 
uh, uh, kind of a, a point of interest as a source for biofuel production. Um, so, but sugarcane in itself is actually a natural wall for hurricanes. It's like bamboo. So it's a very sort of strong protectant, natural protectant. But, but the whole sort of food industry has uh, tried to um, shut down all these sugarcane farms in the whole sort of Florida and Louisiana region. And they want to use uh, corn production instead to, to produce sugar. So there's sort of like, and that is industrialized. Um, so there are kind of many layers here. Um, and working with a farmer, we worked over about 18 months on, on growing the, um, um, the labyrinth. Um, so I got to kind of work with him locally and work with local and sort of embed myself in sort of local farming communities. Um, and this is very close to the Gulf, so it's three hours outside of New Orleans, so it's not like in you know, it's really rural. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the uh, other interesting part is that to the idea of the labyrinth is it's a very old symbol. I mean, it's like you have it in Greek mythology and it's in the quote in the film I use is from um, uh, uh, Borges uh, who used the labyrinth symbolically in very many of his books. Um, and uh, where he talks about the multiple levels of our understanding the world that we or we can take the different paths and in one path we have this relationship with uh, something and then on another but if we took the other part something else like he talks about the parallel worlds which I find very interesting so um, the other thing about the labyrinth is it's like again in churches, it's used as the kind of meditative path or the path to the contemplative path. So it's or it symbolizes the path through life. So there um, are kind of many layers here, but the, the added sensorial experience of working or wandering um, this path uh, and being in all this sugarcane is the amount of oxygen. So you, your brain would get, <laughs> you kind of experience this sort of euphoric um, um, ex, uh, ex state from all the oxygen that you would be absorbing while walking within, within this um, uh, labyrinth. I created uh, the path actually from a game I had as a child. So it's, uh, it's sort of a kind of a personal, uh, uh, piece as well uh, in that way and the scale of it is I think it's like 2,000 square meters the one is one and a half acre so what we did when we started uh, the project is that if, if you see on the right side there's um, there's re recently planted sugarcane so that's what it will looked like when we started so what we did was we planted, we didn't plant, but we took out from the earth where the, pa the pattern of the paths. So it kind of, it was like the opposite, <laughs> um, opposite of the positive uh, that you see of the, the erased uh, plants, sugarcane. So, so it's sort of um, kind of owed to, uh, to, to farming culture and the importance of uh, sustaining um, ecology and sustaining earth and, and, and also respect for old methods of, um, that we, we keep intact um, traditions that work. <laughs> How did the, the farmer or the farmers uh, perceive this work? Well, he, the farmer was quite political, so he thought it was very positive to work with artists and, um, and culture to bring awareness to the importance of sugarcane as an in local industry and for smaller farming. So, um, because a lot of like small farms are being, you know, uh, pushed out by these big industrialized um, uh, companies. 
Um, so he was very positive to it. We had several uh, events there uh, where we brought people. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the, the when we took out the sugar cane and I used uh, for my land art work, I use uh, this pink, these pink markers a lot. Uh, so this is how we constructed um, the 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 pattern itself. Um, yeah. So you were kind of, as a visitor, you were still guided inside the the labyrinth with yeah, these. So, yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the. Uh, in the beginning, so when we opened it, I also had uh, performances. So I had something called the, the Lost Flute. Uh, so I had a flutist play inside of there, which would be like the kind of uh, seduction that you would hear sound and you would follow the sound. So I wanted to create an experience too, and participatory experience for people. Um, and we also brought school children there from New Orleans. Um, so this is in 2010, 2009, 2010. So it was still quite fresh from the devastation of, of, the, of New Orleans. So it was also educational, you know, for, to teach children about agriculture and, and their region, you know. Um, so, so that was really uh, very, positive side to it as well. Yes. So he, he apparently, the farmer kept it. So I yeah. had a time limit for a year, but apparently he kept it. <laughs> but I don't know if, if it exists anymore. <laughs> yes, um, we will, like I mentioned at the beginning and, and now you also um, uh, talked about the flute uh, flute, flutist, flute player, <laughs> um, that it is uh, very uh, customary to you to embed performances inside your works. Um, so we will look into that a bit later. Let's have a look at um, another uh, part of your practice, which is text-based art. And again, I'm going to walk through some works and would love you to tell us about them. Yeah, so I use text, well, text and light as site-specific installations and as way, as way to kind of um, comment on things or to evoke, um, evoke emotions or, or uh, transmit philosophical ideas. So a lot of times I extract um, a statement from something and I transform it, or some of them are my own. Uh, and in order to uh, um, to, commu to communicate a point or to um, to create a situation, but also it you know to place something in a con context of um, of a, you know an infrastructural city or a, a location uh, creates the artwork itself. Uh, this is a piece from that stems from my time in Mexico City, uh, so in 2012, but this was moved to New York in 2013. And it's a site-specific installation that has to do with how uh, cities um, are gentrified, uh, but also, you know, like in Mexico City, it, it's uh, emerged from how we were going to have, so the funeral process, like the time of mourning, um, it, it's a communal experience. And we were going to uh, walk through uh, uh, with this funeral uh, 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 process, uh, walk through city areas where indigenous people or local people have been pushed out and they've built sort of like luxury homes and, and changed very brutally and, and dramatically um, you know people's lives. So in New York City uh, this New York changes very quickly as well so this area this was uh, in collaboration with a um, foundation called No Longer Empty um, where they work with kind of abandoned spaces or they're sort of social political as well and performative pieces so this was um, placed in a neighborhood in Queens um, that it's an Irish neighborhood and this is also gradually changing to um, 
push out, you know, people get pushed out further and further from their neighborhood, the historic neighborhoods or the center of the city. Um, so it's, uh, so it's kind of the, the morning of, of uh, a changing uh, place. This is from the uh, Gold Guides Me stems from, um, this was produced for the Bruges Art and Architecture Triennial in 2015. And I started working with um, the idea of capitalism in the public realm, how on ethics and how we as citizens are valued. And um, this is, um, uh, LED signage. So I'm using uh, advertising signage here and it's sort of modeled after the <laughs> Hollywood sign a little bit in scale. Um, it's about 90 meters long. So Gold Guides Me uh, talks about how we have exchanged um, values for monetary values only. And um, instead from gold, God Guides Me or, or like um, the uh, value of uh, the human value has been uh, uh, kind of monetized. Uh, it comes from, uh, I took the uh, term from Hope Guides Me from Bothius, which was a Roman philosopher and statesman who was imprisoned because he um, tried to uh, uh, imply uh, that we, in this text, uh, that there should be a middle way for the citizen, that we, the value of uh, society shouldn't be only about uh, greed and money and power. Uh, so then I changed it to Gold Guides Me from, from his text. Uh, his book is called the um, Philosophy, sorry, <laughs> it's his prison book that he wrote. Uh, yeah. So this sort of started a whole kind of other uh, text series um, based on, on, on capitalist terms and, and working with uh, advertising signage. And this sign has been also presented in other contexts and, and places. Or yeah, so it, it was in 2018. Uh, it was uh, in Oslo <laughs> at the Oya Music Festival and they had it over the entrance where people pay to go in to experience culture. So, <laughs> so they kind of self-ironically um, employed this uh, to their own, uh, you know, capitalization of other people's uh, uh, performance or, or creativity. And they, they didn't try to hide it, they were just no, yeah, no, no, it was totally ironic. <laughs> and then it was a smaller version, not this exact one, was also placed with um, something called the Museum of Transitory Art in, in Ljubljana, Slovenia, mm -hmm. um, for something called Sonica Festival, which is architecture and sound festival. So they, uh, I wasn't there, but they created it and they placed it on the uh, um, uh, sort of post-Soviet uh, building, uh, concrete building, uh, where they sort of emphasized how, you know, at the end of the transit to the sort of European system where they kind of uh, absorbed the sort of uh, hybridized form of capitalism, the sort of hyper-capitalism and dereg totally deregulated and, um, and, and uh, so that was their kind of uh, criticism of uh, their own society that they wanted to, to um, to highlight. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, at this uh, point I will again show a tiny video clip and we might be lucky that it is embedded here with sound I am hoping. <laughs> Thank you. 
This was a, a short clip um, that I wanted to share at this point, because as said, um, what is fascinating with your work is that you always, while you invite the visitors and the, um, and the guests and viewers to your works, you always also invite other colleagues and artists to work with you and perform inside your art. So could you talk a bit about that? How, um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this installation is uh, called Soft Geometry Liquid Commodity. It was in 2015. So I started this new series of neon wall sculptures that create an illusion of space um, through, they look like they're three dimensional objects and very simple. Uh, objects like triangles or, or squares but that don't quite make sense so this installation was it was in a tiny space on the lower east side in new york that was right next to a um, uh, shop um, selling uh, objects selling uh, like kitchen objects so this sort of little world of being surrounded by these uh, neon sculptures um, uh, gave me the idea of inviting the, a composer friend of mine, um, uh, Cusca, who's uh, a Brazilian musician and composer, to respond to the work. So I had three different performances there with three different art, um, artists in different uh, practices than my own. So what he he played, it was uh, based on like based on we talked about how color feels and how the uh, atmosphere of being within this installation felt and how you could uh, translate that into sound. Um, so it's another language than vocalizing, verbalizing it or, or write it or, uh, as text. Um, the other performance I had was by the French artist uh, Patrice Le Rocheroy, <laughs> um, who did um, who performed a, a historic a Fluxus piece from, uh, I think, 1967 um, that we documented. Uh, and then I had an, um, another, the third uh, performance was by a sound artist, uh, also Brazilian, uh, Natalie de Campo, who recorded sounds from the uh, neighborhood, from the area. And then she created a live sound performing uh, sound performance with um, uh, sort of uh, with the sounds from the area and just uh, played it live. Um, so that was and and with her was the saxophonist, a Swedish saxophonist, um, Ilhan Elsahan, 
El, El Sahin, who lives here, uh, who has a jazz club, he's a musician, and he, uh, so they had a dialogue between them with like abstract uh, um, uh, saxophone sounds and then her recordings from the neighborhood that they just sort of performed then and there. Uh, so that was that was really an interesting way of sort of um, working through different uh, kind of uh, reactions to the installation, uh, both through word and fluxus and in the moment, and then his more musical, uh, purely musical piece, and then the interactive uh, duo uh, performance. Lastly, yeah. And how important is it for your work to create these like dialogues with different art forms inside your own work? Um, I think, well, I'm in very inspired by sound and I think um, uh, sound, I mean, it's all like frequencies, sound, light and color work in frequencies. So um, it's just another way, it's just like I uh, include text in my work, we're working with ideas, philosophical ideas or creating new ideas. So there are different ways of perceiving the work and understanding the work and, and um, absorbing the work. Uh, and also how other res others respond to it, it, I find very interesting too. I see once you create a work, it's out in the world, it belongs to everybody. <laughs> So it's not mine, just mine to, that people have to see at a distance. I think it's sort of, I think it's interesting when the artwork merges with others and not to dictate, this is how it's perceived and that's it, you know? So it kind of, the artwork grows with that. Um, so, and you learn from it too, uh, you learn, and then it evolves as well. So it, it gives opportunities to experience new works from one starting point. It's kind of like a doorway that you can uh, explore new possibilities uh, from this one artwork. Exactly. Well, um, you give us um, a very good link to the next um, practice series that you have by mentioning a doorway. Um, acrylic sculptures and uh, let's start with the, <laughs> with the <laughs> <all right. laughs> yeah so these uh, neon sculptures uh, the idea of experiencing vast space um, uh, was a starting point to how can one contain that and how does one experience vastness of space and infinity but contained in a box but the, but the box appears as an infinite infinity within itself. So I used then that the method of, there are some artists uh, who work with these uh, wall pieces or floor pieces where you get this infinity illusion. But I created, I developed this new other method of creating a freestanding version where you can walk around it. So you have the illusion of like infinity but from all sides of it so it's a three-dimensional so it's like a portal but standing as an object in space <laughs> so um i also work then with color so like for this blue piece i have red on the back side so these colors interact and they do things to each other um uh, so there's a and the hair, I when you I worked with pink and yellow, but at some points when you look from uh, one edge, the the yellow becomes green next to the pink. So there's a kind of continuous, um, continuous changing uh, uh, of, of the object. And uh, I also use mirror on the outside. So these the neon is very hard to <laughs> document a photograph, but um, and I would have to show this with the light off, but uh, on the artworks, but when you, so there's mirror on the inside and outside, which is transparent. So it also absorbs the surrounding um, space around it. Um, so if you have these placed in 
uh, an environment, the environment will become part of the artwork. So if it's in the forest, you will see the trees in green mm. uh, around it. Or in, in the white space, white gallery, uh, white cube, it, it, it stands as sort of this sort of portal and um, minimalist sculpture, Baroque minimalist sculpture. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, we're actually now coming to um, the the project um, why we are here now. <laughs> so let's have a look at a um, um, short video about the Radical Light project that uh, was at the Kai Art Center in Tallinn and in Seinäjoki Kunsthalle. And I will see if I can show it from the Vimeo instead, so we have a better uh, picture. Here. Radical Light is the title of my exhibition at Seinöjoki Kunsthal um, that consists of two installations. Uh, one is a large-scale um, neon uh, sculptural installation and the second is a video projection installation. The title Radical Light relates to the idea of radicalizing a space or, or expanding outside of a space, outside of the confinements of a space. And that also relates to how we exist in the space and that we, how we experience a space. The neon sculptural installation uh, elements uh, relate to human perception and how we perceive uh, space and our existence in a way. It works with the sensorial language and our cognitive language. So light affects us, light temperatures and color frequencies affect our whole system and also how sound affects our system as well. The experience of being inside of a large-scale installation uh, like this is that you become part of the in installation, you become part of the artwork itself. We live in such a fast-paced world today, so to be allowed to spend time in an installation where you are extracted out of time in a way, and to just absorb and be with the installation is a really important thing. It allows you to, to just be with the artwork and contemplate and, and sort of uh, just experience your own self, your cognitive system and how, how the light affects you. To install in Holly is really perfect for this installation. The, the dialogue between the light and the minimalism of the installation and the purity of it together with the industrial architecture is really uh, complements each other very well. So it's actually a perfect match and um, I'm very excited to, to open it.
So um, here, actually, I will tell everyone that, um, and now, thanks to the pandemic, I uh, am maybe mixing um, years, but it was uh, 2020 in January that you had the ex exactly, okay. Yeah, so um, I had been talking to Seniorki Kunsthalle um, prior to this exhibition and, and talking about uh, curatorial collaborations and, and looking into what we could do together. Um, and then at the same time, I had learned about Anne's uh, work and, and with great excitement saw that um, she was opening this exhibition in Kai. And Kai also is a familiar um, institution or organization to me. It's located in a tiny bit outside of the Tallinn city center in an old uh, submarine factory. Uh, a wonderful art hall, um, but also a demanding space uh, in its way to exhibit art. So um, Kai as a space was new, and then this was the first visit that I had there. And then I, I was uh, obviously <laughs> completely blown away by the experience of this installation. And um, as you can see, the work is very different in, in this white space of Kai and then in this darker space of uh, Seinejoki. And we discussed the work um, with Anne because here um, in Kai, for me, the work had so much to do with white and whiteness and how we experience light in, in this space. And then when you experience the, the work in, um, in Seinejoki, it became like a meditative space where I, I just lost the track of time and myself. And suddenly the work came about more about space than white light itself. And I think that here, um, like said earlier and, and how you describe yourself, you, you have this very transformational um, process in your work that you and that you kind of like invite us to share with you. So could you talk us uh, a bit about this work? Um, so when Radical Light opened in January 2020, um, it was conceived as exploring space through radical space through white, white tonalities. So I worked with the um, uh, color frequencies of uh, uh, 4100 Kelvin, like a medium white and going up onto the cold white. And again, these uh, um, uh, installations, these artworks are, um, I, I create, I, I juxtapose the color temperatures as if, as through sound. Uh, so they kind of synesthetically experienced too. So working, uh, exploring the whole sort of whiteness, the fullest whiteness possible and the vastness of space um, and anarchy of space. When you, when I was invited to uh, bring the work to Sainayoki, um, the history of it, both spaces being former kind of military spaces and, and having intra, you know, um, kind of very different usages, but also the scale of the spaces were kind of similar. But the, ju the juxtaposition of battleship grey tones and numbers and I industrial um, uh, kind of uh, aesthetics uh, created a whole new level of, of um, presenting the artwork and, and a whole new sort of dialogue with uh, entropy, if you want. Uh, so the, the architecture restored it, uh, uh, Tim uh, Hirvilami, who uh, rest beautifully restored the building, he, they sp he sprayed concrete on, in the ceiling there. So you see this very rough uh, grid, um, that I worked with in uh, to the, 
so emphasize each other that dialogue with um kind of the the, the sort of uh, passage of time with the purity of the white light it, it kind of um allows us but it sort of emphasizes the his the the, the sort of decay but also cleanses it in a way and it also uh, enhances the the neon light sculpture itself as a sculpture as an artwork well in the white space it's a lot more merged with the sort of this large vaulted uh, submarine factory ceiling and um well here the sort of grayness and, and gravity of the space there's a sort of uh, push and pull between those uh, the lightness and and the gravity and also the i want to emphasize the sound um environment which is um composed by jg thurwell who i've worked with for many years now it's um the sound is composed after um, sort of experiencing both it's sort of vast sound uh, scapes and then trickling into uh, the kind of uh, particles of electricity and uh, that is transmitted through the neon uh, tubes the glass tubes and so you move through this sort of you're surrounded by this abstract sound that that sort of emphasizes the whole uh, experience of being within a light structure and and um, this combination of um, a horizon and then the vertical rising light exactly and and what um as a detail of experiencing to work um is the like you were saying the horizon and what is so extremely impressive to me that when you move into space the line of horizon that you can see here in the middle always remains between the tubes it never goes over or under it it's like you feel that you are inside a like a mathematically coordinated surrounding it because you're it is it's kind of your um, guideline in in going around the work but yeah i mean and i want to thank you for um sharing your extensive and, and fascinating <laughs> artistic practice with us and i would like to at this stage actually open the conversation to um our colleagues annika do you have